Good morning, and welcome to the Lion's Street Church of Christ. Uh, we want to welcome you today and just say that today we're in store for a treat. We want you to tune in because um, the believer has an obligation to live a life that is worthy of the gospel. The Apostle Paul said that we ought to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the very gospel that we have adhered to. And when we do that, we become an example to others and a draw to others into the love of Christ. So today we're going to be talking about uh, practical steps toward living the new life. Uh, if you are indeed a believer, we must be a contrast to uh, worldly practices. So we hope that you tune in and you are able to get the principles uh, and apply them to your life that will set you on a course to living the new life in Christ Jesus. We have come into this house to magnify the Lord and worship Him. We have come into this house to magnify the Lord and worship Him. We social media platforms, we're so delighted that you came to uh, worship with us in spirit and in truth. At this time, I would ask you to please stand and repeat after me the call to worship. It will be from the book of Psalms, the ver uh, chapters 100 and the verses 1 through 5. That is Psalms, chapter 100, verses 1 through 5. And if you have it, repeat after me. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with thanksgiving. Come before his presence with thanksgiving. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us. It is he that hath made us. And not we ourselves. And not we ourselves. We are his people. We are his people. And the sheep of his pasture. And the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise. And into his courts with praise. And thankful. Unto him, and, unto him and, bless and bless his name. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. And his truth endureth to all generations. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for that you allowing us once again to be able to come out and sing praises and worship you in your name and spirit and truth. Heavenly Father, we just ask you to continue to be with us as we go through this pandemic situation and just through so many, term, uh, uh, dealing with so much turmoil and struggles in this time, Heavenly Father, we just pray to you that you will give us the strength, you give us the perseverance to keep on keeping on. Heavenly Father, I pray for this land and country that we're living in. I pray for the leaders, Heavenly Father, that we do things according to your will and not our own. Heavenly Father, continue to be with us as a church family that we stay girded in your truth, and that we continue to study your word, to study of thyself 
your proof of sound doctrine, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, continue to be with this church family here, that we may together just become more and more followers and worshipers of you and love one another. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the things that you have done for us continually, and we're just asking blessings for those who are dealing with sickness, pain, and struggle. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the things you've given us, and we ask all of these blessings in your Son's name, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. We now come to the point of worship where we commemorate the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And at this time, I will be singing, I know it was the blood. And I know it was the blood. Well, and I know it was the blood. Well, and I know it was the blood for me. Well, and one day when I was lost, you know that he died on the cross. Yes, he did. And I know it was the blood for me. And now we come to the segment in our worship where we celebrate the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we do that through what we call the communion. And I want to just share something with you today that really, I think, uh, encapsulates the full import of what communion is all about and why we celebrate. For the Bible says um, that we who are in Christ are a new creation. And that new creation simply stands in contrast with the former condition of the lost. We were all lost in our trespasses and sins. The Bible says we were dead. But now through the finished work of Christ on the cross, we've been made alive. Those of us who have adhered to the very uh, gospel through our obedience of faith. And so the obedient man is now a new creation or a new creature. In other words, the Bible tells us the old things have passed away. All things now have become new. So we celebrate the new relationship that we have. And as we partake of these emblems, we're really saying, thank you, Lord, for delivering us from the bondage of sin. For when we were dead, you have now quickened us or made us alive in Christ Jesus. So now we have been called into a new relationship. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. So every first day of the week when we come together, we celebrate the new relationship we have that was made possible through the finished work of Jesus on the cross. So let us at this time give thanks for these emblems. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for Jesus who came and who uh, died on the cross uh, for our sins. And now, dear God, as we put forth our hands and partake of this bread, we are remembering the great sacrifice uh, that he made by giving himself uh, to the cross that we may now live in him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Also, let us give thanks for the cup. Heavenly Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, we are uh, aware of the sacrifice of Jesus. We are aware of the significance of his blood that we have now been washed uh, in water uh, through his blood, and we now enjoy uh, this new covenant relationship. So we thank you today uh, for the precious blood of Jesus that has cleansed us and has given us a new life in Christ Jesus. For it's in his name we do pray. Amen. Now, as believers, uh, we understand the significance of stewardship. The Bible is replete in different examples of how we are to exercise proper stewardship. One of the fundamental elements of a steward is that he be found faithful. The idea of stewardship simply means that you have been put in charge for management of those affairs of another. And God has given us everything, and everything belongs to him. So when we give, we're acknowledging the fact that what we have is really not ours. And so therefore, as we properly manage what he gives to us, uh, we give back uh, a, a portion, uh, which signifies we're giving out all in all to him. So if we give today, I just want to encourage you 
to understand that everything belongs to God. God has entrusted uh, uh, our ability to get wealth. He's entrusted us with uh, the material things. Now, we, we, we express our thing given to him when we give back, knowing that as we uh, give of our monetary means, it goes to the ability of the kingdom. And also, it, it, it shows a heart of uh, sensitivity to the fact that God is the great giver and he has first given to us. So let us exercise proper stewardship today as we give back uh, to God that which he has given to us. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity and the privilege uh, to give, knowing, dear God, that you are the great giver and that we follow your example as it relates to stewardship. Uh, we trust that the things uh, that we accumulate for you will be going toward the furthest of your kingdom and also give us a sensitive heart to always seek opportunities uh, to give to those who are less fortunate. For we understand it's more blessed to give uh, than it is to receive. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. When we reach that city of the New Jerusalem, we're gonna sing, we're gonna sing. Life. 
uh, I want to provide with, to you today uh, the very uh, easy blueprint for living uh, the new life in Christ. The Bible will not tell us to live a new life without giving us instruction on how to do so. For the Bible uh, it is very, very clear that we need to have a new walk and talk, but then it also gives us a very fundamental practical step to take to ensure that we're able to achieve that end. And my objective is simply that we may walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, that we may walk in a way that we bring glory and honor to God. And our walk, or our conversation, or our manner of life should be that which builds up rather than tears down. That we become an attractive incentive to others who are still lost and broken in darkness to find their way into the saving relationship of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So therefore, I'll give you enough time. You ought to be in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and again, we're going to take a, a, a broad brush stroke today. I, I wanted to perhaps... Uh, teach a series of lessons uh, using these first 17 verses incrementally. But for today, I'm going to use all those verses, and we're going to try to capture one succinct thing as it relates to how we go about living the new life in Christ. And, and so again, I want to say uh, that there are certain uh, prerequisites. There are certain things we need to understand before we engage in this message today. We have to understand where we are. And this is to believers. That if you're not a member of the body of Christ, you have an opportunity to do so. But first of all, we need to understand where we are in Christ Jesus so that we can understand how we are to live as citizens in God's kingdom. Notice what the Bible will say in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. Uh, as Paul talks to the body of believers, he says, uh, speaking of them, he said, uh, he, he honored God, and he said, God, who delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have our redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. So in other words, we have been translated from the domain of darkness. We've been rescued and delivered from darkness, and we have been now placed into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Now, the deliverance uh, in and of itself is a beautiful thing. But now that we are in the kingdom of God's dear son, now how do we operate? How do we live as citizens of the kingdom? There ought to be a contrast between those in the kingdom of darkness, how they live, and those in the kingdom of light. And so we understand we as believers have received this divine privilege. There also be, should be a divine responsibility as to how we ought to live. And so having said that, uh, I want to, first of all, give you something that's going to help you. First of all, I want to give you the motivation as well as the method for living the new life in Christ. First of all, if we look at verses 1 through 4 in this text, and I'm going to read that, okay? I want to talk about uh, if you're going to live the new life, we must uh, live from a heavenly perspective. A heavenly perspective. Notice what the Bible says. Uh, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 1 through 4. It says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things uh, on the earth. He goes on to say, For ye are dead, uh, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who in our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Well, that means that, see, that statement is couched in a, an argument. And the argument is, because of our union with Christ, we ought to now uh, be able to mimic him and live a life that brings honor to him. For example, in Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 12, uh, well, the preceding verse talks about we have been, we have received the circumcision made without hands. But what is the circumcision made without hands? See, circumcision uh, in the Old Testament is when uh, uh, the, the, the foreskin of the male child was cut. It was cut away uh, from the male child. Now, the spiritual circumcision in where, in where uh, sin is cut away from our hearts. 
So we have received the circumcision made without hands. And how did that go about? Well, in verse number 12, uh, the Bible talks about, uh, he presents his argument. He said, being buried with him in baptism, we are trusting in the very operation of God. So when a person is baptized into Christ, he is submitting to baptism knowing that God is provide, performing a divine operation on the heart. He is eradicating and cutting away the sin of his life. And so the argument is uh, the union between Christ and his people in virtue of his death. They, because of his death, now are dead to sin. Make sense? And if that makes sense, that if Christ died and we were baptized into his death, we died to sin. In virtue of his resurrection, however, we now rise to live a spiritual life. Therefore, as Christ now lives in heaven, we, or they, should live uh, for heaven and fix our affections on things above. That being said, I'd like to give you the spiritual requirements for this new life, okay? Uh, it, it is couched in the very obedience to the prerequisites of the gospel. Our uh, gospel is, you know, simply the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, right? So a person has to come in believing, number one, they sin. And those sins have separated them from God. And therefore, I need uh, what Jesus offers me. And so, therefore, if I believe that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God, and I want to turn from the way of the world and turn to the way of the kingdom of God, I, 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 that's called repentance. And then I need to acknowledge that I do believe that he is indeed the Messiah, because the Bible says many works that Jesus did which are not written in this book. But these things were written so that you may believe that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God, and through believing you may have life in his name. So confessing him as Lord is essential, and then being buried in the water grave of baptism for the remission of your sin puts you in covenant relationship. And that's what Colossians uh, 2 and 12 is talking about. And so now we find ourselves in this text where we understand that uh, there are prerequisites for entering into the new life. Go back and read in John chapter 3 where Jesus talks to Nicodemus, and he talks about how one must be born again or must be born from above in order to see or enter into the very kingdom of God. Well, it's obedience uh, to the prerequisites of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We understand that Jesus, he came to earth on a mission, and he died, and he was buried on the third day. Those are fundamental facts, but let's put a little flesh on the bones. He said he died for our sins. Hello. All that was according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again on the third day, and the resurrection declared him to be the Son of God with power. Yes, yeah, and he sits on the right hand of the Father. Now, uh, uh, the Bible says, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he said, let me make known unto you, uh, brethren, uh, the gospel which I preach to you, which you receive, wherein you also stand, and by which you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preach unto you, except you believe in vain, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried and that he uh, was raised on the third day according to the scripture. If you can't accept that, you really can't accept Christ. But when you can accept that, then you can conform to the very pattern of that teaching. Romans chapter 6 talks about us being uh, uh, buried into his death through baptism. Yes, yeah, when you are baptized, you are baptized into the very benefits of his death. He died for you, but you have to embrace that. Yes, yeah, and then you rise to walk in newness of life. And as you rise uh, from the water grave of baptism to walk in newness of life, therefore now we must begin to practice certain things uh, associated with the new life in Christ. Well, we have to understand the spiritual value of the new life. You see, as you formerly embraced earthly values, now we are called to pursue heavenly values. As we were, uh, the Bible would say in Ephesians chapter 2, we were, uh, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. As we walked according to the course of this world, uh, 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 adhering 
into the now life of this world. Dead works. But now uh, we have been made alive and quickened in Christ Jesus. And now we have been, uh, we're his workmanship. We're called to, to live and work, engage in good works. Uh, they bring glory and honor to the Father. So that's important for us to understand that now we, in this, we have a new uh, relationship and the, what we formerly embraced must be denounced. That we can now embrace the very principles of the new life in Christ Jesus. Yes, spiritual power arises from the new life. Because when you begin to live uh, your life by saying yes to God, you're not able to say no to the ways of this world. Power to say yes to righteousness uh, and say no to worldliness. And when you do that, your life becomes a stark contrast between uh, uh, the ways of death and the way that lead us to life. When you were in your own converted state, talk to believers now, uh, you, you serve the direst lusts uh, and your pleasures. Now that you have been delivered, uh, the idea is don't return to that which you have been delivered from. So therefore, number one, we have to understand uh, that uh, we have to live from a heavenly perspective. And if, if, if we live from a heavenly perspective, it means that we must leave the worldly practices. Hello. We must leave the worldly practices. And I think that's outlined very well by the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter, uh, in chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. Let's see what the Bible says there. He says, uh, based on what he said in verses 1 through 4, he now says, Mortify, therefore, your members, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affections, and evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things uh, shall the wrath of God come on the children of disobedience? In the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. But now, I like that, but now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, and blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. In other words, he is simply saying this new life uh, has to be, uh, it mandates that we lead old worldly practices, the practices of your former life. Since you are dead to sin uh, in the world and are to appear with Christ in the glory of his kingdom, subdue every carnal and evil propensity, inclination of your nature. See, when he said that we need to mortify our body, he, he really is saying we are to put to death sinful attitudes and actions. Put to death those uh, attitudes and those behaviors. Uh, you have to say no. No to those things. Well, why do we do that? It goes on to say, uh, if you are used to eating a certain diet, and you develop a taste for certain kinds of food, you're going to have those cravings. You know, right now, you know, every now and then I say, I'm going to stop drinking coffee. And I stop drinking coffee for a certain amount of time, right? And then the longer I deny myself of the coffee, the more the craving is diminished. But when I drink coffee on a regular basis, I may wake up and the first thing I want to do is get a cup of coffee. And then it becomes a craving and it begins to be harder and harder to say no to. But once you begin to practice uh, depriving yourself of certain things, it becomes easier for you to divorce yourself of it altogether. So the point is, we are to uh, deprive ourselves or divorce ourselves from certain attitudes that are sinful attitudes. Don't let sin have power over you. Don't let uh, certain things of this world have more strength than you have. You ought to be able to denounce those things. The sinful actions action and those, the sensual appetites uh, that we have in our carnality. Let's face it, all of us, all of us uh, have to strive against the flesh. 
We have to work against the flesh. So again, it's important for us to understand that we have to deprive ourselves or divorce ourselves from those things associated with our former manner of life and substitute those things by seeking those things which are above, where Christ is. We need to put our affection with Christ. And the more you crave godliness and righteousness, the less time you will have and the less power, the sensuality, and all of those things will have over you. Notice, uh, he begins to help us to codify uh, what he's talking about. He says uh, fornication, uh, which we talked about last week, that comes from the word pornea, which is all kinds of sexual sin. It goes on to say, uh, uh, it, it, and there is a, a, a general uh, inappropriateness of certain activity. You may say, well, I didn't, even, I didn't commit fornication, but I, I, I associate that, I, I feed myself with a lot of lewdness. And those kind of things uh, uh, corrode my spirituality. So I need to be on guard for sinful action, but also sinful and sensual attitudes. Sinful attitudes, that is certain a desire, that word concupiscence, that's, a, that's that lust and desire. Uh, and longings for those sensual things that are inappropriate for, for, for the believer. Another motivation is because simply there is a punishment, a punishment uh, that awaits those who persist in those kind of behaviors. Uh, the Bible says in verse number 6, he says, For which things say the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. So therefore, we have to make sure that we're divorcing ourselves from those things because God is not pleased with those kind of behaviors. And we who name the name of Christ should make sure that we are not associated with the thing that brings displeasure to our Lord and Savior. And so therefore, the plea is not to return to the former man of life. He goes on to say verse, verse, in verse number 7, he says, in the which ye also walked. So as he talks to believers, he says, well, you know where you came from. We know that we have, we, we, you know, we, <laughs> you know, we, we didn't wake up saved. We've lived a life uh, that uh, helps us to have a sensitivity to those who are still groping in darkness. If you have been delivered, then you have a responsibility to, to make sure you can rescue someone else. So therefore, you have to make sure that you don't return uh, to the very lifestyle that you've been delivered from. You have to go back and rescue somebody else. And you can't rescue somebody else if your life, you know, mirrors theirs. Okay? So, since you have been delivered from the penalty of sin, uh, resist the power of sin by seeking the heavenly calling. Resist the power of sin by seeking those things that are above. Line yourself up uh, with the mind of Christ. And therefore, you can find yourself uh, having the power to say yes to God and no uh, to sin. Third, let me just say this. And not only must you leave worldly practices, but let love manifest spiritual perfectness. Verse number 10 uh, through 14, the Bible says, And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Uh, it goes on to say where... There is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, uh, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. That simply is telling us, that is telling us uh, that, and I'm going to read verses 12 through 14 in a minute, but I'm going to stop right there. It simply tells us that we are to, that we've been made new, first of all. You who are in Christ, you have been made new. Well, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, 5, excuse me, 5 and verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, or he is a new creation. Behold, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so, therefore, uh, because of this new uh, relationship, we need to let love manifest spiritual perfectness. And the word perfect here uh, is not to say that we have now become uh, perfect. In, in, in actuality, it comes from the word teleos. The word teleos um, is translated perfect, but it also is translated mature, complete, fully furnished. So if we strive for spiritual maturity, 
The believer ought to be able to exercise spiritual disciplines that puts him in line on the path of holiness. Being made new consists of knowledge and righteousness uh, and true holiness. So that's what God gives us a plan for renewal. Uh, the plan for renewal is simply by knowledge of preferred relationship. Now, there was a time when man had a perfect relationship with the Father. Remember in the Garden of Eden, Adam enjoyed continuous communion and communication with God. Beautiful, they called it paradise. The beautiful relationship, unmarred relationship. Uh, but because of sin, uh, that was severed and we have to be restored back to that. Jesus comes to give us a new paradise, a new uh, relationship with the Father. So therefore, we need to make sure that uh, we have a knowledge of the preferred relationship uh, of communion and harmony with the Father. But also there is the purpose. Uh, the purpose of this new relationship is to transcend all of these man-made barriers. Man-made barriers. Those, he said, are neither uh, Greek or Jew. Circumcision or uncircumcision. You know, bond the freak. All of those, all of those constricting and uh, racial barriers and, and all of those things, they ought to be dissolved in the kingdom of God. We see that the love of God is able to transcend all of those barriers. The love of God is able to move us away from racism and prejudice. And uh, the love of God moves us away from, you know, the caste or class systems uh, that continue to exploit and degrade and demean one another. The love of God. It's able to break the bond of slavery. The love of God is able to break the bond of bigotry and hatred, malice, and all of those things that we've been called to live based on the love of God and demonstrated in him sending his only begotten son into the world for us. And we ought to follow that model if we will take the steps toward living the new life. It's a love-based relationship. And when you love someone, your practice, your very practice, uh, your manner of life is going to personify the love that you profess by the thing that you do. And then uh, we ought to pursue this perfection because as the elect of God, we are God's elect, right? And as the elect of God, we ought to pursue a higher aspect of Christ-like love. Christ-like love is a sacrificial love. It is a uh, not because of love, but an in spite of love. The key to contrasting the new life in Christ and the, it, between that life and the old life is that we must kill. We must put to death the old man uh, that we may now be able to live according to the new life prerequisites. Love. Love is the key. Now finally, let me give you this and the lesson will be yours. Uh, we are to be leading others uh, to godly peace. Leading others to godly peace. You see, when love manifests true perfection in our lives, it's going to change how we see the world. And it ought to change how the world sees us. So therefore, uh, let the peace of Christ uh, be your judge. Decide and govern uh, your heart as the judge. See, the, it gives, it, it, the imagery of the Olympian contest. The Olympics uh, in ancient times uh, were they had different judges who would judge and qualify or disqualify a person based on them meeting the requirements of the rules and regulations set forth. And just as this person was the judge, we ought to let the peace of Christ judge us. We ought to let the peace of Christ dictate what we ought to do, how we ought to live. For example, let peace uh, rule in your heart. See, peace cannot rule if you are on the throne. See, the only way for peace to rule is that Christ sits on the throne of your heart. So you need to dethrone yourself, uh, give over yourself over to the Lordship of Christ, so therefore the peace can rule in your heart. Not only does the peace have to rule in your heart, he says, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. When the word of Christ is dwelling in you, then you can think on the things from above. Then you can possess the very mind of Christ. 
then you can begin to live a life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So therefore, not only let peace rule, but let the word dwell in you. And when the word dwells, uh, then the name of Christ will be glorified in your living. Those are the motivations for us living this life. Those are the very requisites of the, or the requirements necessary for you to live a life that brings honor and glory to God. Not only uh, will it glorify God, it would edify the church. But not only will it edify the church, it will, uh, it will sensitize your heart to the needs of others. And it will also sensitize the hearts of others to realize they need to be in the right relationship with Jesus Christ. So again, when we talk about this idea of uh, living the new life, the Bible gives us everything we need to understand of the motivation to live the new life, everything we need to know to uh, uh, be warned against the old life, but then the incremental steps necessary for you to take on the very character of Jesus Christ. The effective steps toward living the new life is accomplished by ensuring that everything that you do in word or even in deed is to glorify your heavenly Father. And when you do that, you will be a perfect and complete person in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for your word that gives us a blueprint as to how we ought to live and express ourselves in this new life. Uh, we thank you for the new life that has been given to us through uh, the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. Now help us to live resurrected lives as we walk on earth among men, that they may see and know that you are indeed the Christ, and your word must be adhered to in order for them to have everlasting life. Empower us to be a beacon of light to others, that they may also be saved. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. And God bless you.